I attempted a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold, but instead of only using one type of Pokemon, I wanted to try something a bit different. I decided it was finally time for me to use my head for once in my life. So for this challenge, I'll be doing exactly that. I can only use Pokemon that fall from trees when I headbutt them. Right away, there's a bit of an obstacle, as there are no Pokemon I can catch before getting to the Move Tutor in the Ilex Forest that learn the move Headbutt, with the exception of Slowpoke, but that would take way too long. My solution to this problem was to replace Chikorita with a Cubone, who happens to learn Headbutt at level 11. After completing Professor Elm's errands for him, even though he seems to have plenty of time to do them himself, I return to the lab to identify the thief after Lyra saves me from being thrown in Poke Prison. She gives me some Pokeballs, then I level up Headbutt the Cubone and start going around Johto bashing trees. One of the advantages of this challenge is just how many Pokemon I'll be able to get early on, as there's dozens of Headbutt trees all over Johto. Those encounters will start to dry up pretty quickly though. In New Bark Town, I catch Lana the Execute. On Route 29, I catch Pam the Hoot Hoot, who happens to have a pretty terrible nature, but I'm willing to look past her flaws and appreciate her for who she is. I scrounge up every Poke Dollar I have left to load up on Pokeballs because we're just getting started. Back on Route 46, I'm able to catch Ray the Spiro, who has an excellent nature, offsetting the bad vibes Pam was bringing to the table. Over on Route 30, I overcome my fear of spiders and catch Krieger the Spinarak who resets the vibes back to negative with his minus attack nature and his eight legs and general creepiness. The party isn't over yet though, as on Route 31 I catch Mallory the Pineco, and her adamant nature is excellent and the team is really coming together. Having five Pokemon before the first gym may seem like an unfair advantage, but Faulkner and his flying type Pokemon are a real issue for us. One of the biggest challenges we're going to face is a lot of the Pokemon I'm able to add to the team share a lot of weaknesses. Thankfully, we have a few birds of our own and Ray is able to pick up some attack EVs by pecking his way through Sprout Tower. It's time to see whose birds are truly the most powerful. I lead with Ray versus Pidgey and I opt to go for Fury Attack in hopes of getting multiple hits or a crit, but it only hits twice. Pidgey retaliates with a weak tackle, then it goes down to a peck. Ray levels up, which is important because Faulkner sends out a level 13 Pidgeotto, which is clearly cheating. Ray's Fury Attack does substantially less damage this time around, and still only manages to hit twice. Then a tackle from Pidgeotto does a decent chunk of damage. Not wanting to risk Ray to a critical hit, I swap into Pam who tanks a tackle. Pidgeotto goes for Roost and Pam misses a Hypnosis. She manages to connect with one on the following turn, and while Pidgeotto is asleep, I send in Lana. Pidgeotto then wakes up and hits a Gust, which crits and takes Lana to just 5 HP. That was almost a disaster. Thankfully, Lana is a tough egg to crack, and she lands a Leech Seed. I swap into Ray, who gets taken to just 2 HP with yet another critical hit. Really uncool, Faulkner. I have to switch again, so I send Pam back in, but this time he just goes for a tackle. Pidgeotto outspeeds, but goes for a roost, and Pam hits a Hypnosis. With Pidgeotto asleep and Leech Seed and Peck chipping away at it, Pam is able to bring Pidgeotto to what must be 1 HP before it wakes up and goes for a roost. At this point though, it's too late. Pam is healed back up and she's able to finish off Pidgeotto and earn us the first badge. After narrowly escaping death, I head to the Pokemart where one of Professor Elm's aides hands me an egg. But I already have an egg, so I wait until he leaves and then throw it away. I make it to Route 33 where I can headbutt some more trees and eventually find Cheryl the Apom. Because of the specific order I chose to encounter my Pokemon in, the only viable encounter remaining when I get to Azalea Town happens to be one of the most important, and that's Katya the Heracross. Heracross is an excellent Pokemon, and with the Guts ability, she'll be unstoppable. Well, that sucks. In spite of having Swarm, Katya will still be an incredible team member. Not having Guts does change some of the complex strategies I wanted to apply later on in this challenge, like sweeping through entire teams by spamming Facade. I guess I'll have to be a bit more creative now. Kurt enthusiastically chases after Team Rocket, then conveniently injures his back, so now he can't help do anything. So it's up to me to chase them off before heading back to town to take on the second gym. Normally Bugsy Scyther is a massive threat, but Katya is just as strong and happens to learn the move Aerial Ace at level 13, which just misses out on a KO on Scyther on the second hit. Bugsy heals, but it accomplishes nothing as Katya gets the KO the second time around. Then instead of risking overleveling her for the next gym, I swap to Ray, who takes care of Metapod and Kakuna and earns us our second badge. After defeating Bugsy, our rival shows up, gets himself angry about something insignificant, then challenges us to a battle. Cheryl is able to take out Ghastly thanks to a flinch from Astonish, then he sends in Quala Lava, which is a pretty serious threat to the team. I would love to just bash my way through the game with Katya, but I cannot afford to risk losing her, especially right before Whitney. I decide to opt for the noble strategy of spamming sand attacks with Cheryl. She hits 3 before switching to Scratch, but then she gets hit with the smoke screen. I go for Astonish and get the flinch. Then after a second, Quilava misses another smoke screen. If he was this mad about me defeating Team Rocket, I'm sure this sequence absolutely infuriated him. That is, if the AI is capable of understanding human emotion. 
Cheryl manages to avoid taking any damage and finishes off Guilava. Then I send in Ray to deal with the Zubat and win us the battle. I chase around some birds in the Ilex forest and get the HM for cut. Then headbutt some trees until I catch Frambois the Caterpie. After Lyra sticks me in the friend zone, I make it to Goldenrod City. This is the home of one of the most notorious gym leaders in all of Pokemon, Whitney. Normally her mill tank would be terrifying, but with Katya on my side, I'm feeling pretty confident. She's able to knock out Clefairy with a Brick Break. Then mill tank comes in. Brick Break takes her to quite literally one HP, but because Katya outspeeds, she can get the KO on the following turn after Whitney heals. I can't imagine how much more difficult this run would be if I couldn't use Heracross for this battle. Everyone else on the team is weak to a rock type rollout with the exception of Cheryl. Thankfully we don't have to find out how many attempts it would have taken me to get past her. With the level cap at 25, I can now evolve quite a few team members. Ray evolves into a Fero, Pam into a Knocked Owl, and Krieger into Nightmare Fuel. Over in the Burn Tower our rival shows up, but he isn't much of a threat. I climb down the ladder and the legendary dogs get startled and run off. Clearly they were terrified of Cheryl. Someone who should definitely be terrified of Cheryl is Morty, as she's able to learn the move Shadow Claw from the TM I found over on Route 42, and her normal typing means she can't be hit by ghost type attacks. She's able to get a few easy KOs, then Gengar comes in and uses Mean Look. He survives a Shadow Claw and then hits a Hypnosis. The only move he can do damage with is Sucker Punch, so I switch to Baton Pass so it will fail, but Cheryl wakes up and I switch into Pam. Gengar hits another Hypnosis, but at this point Morty is just delaying the inevitable. It's better to just rip off the Band-Aid, buddy. He puts Pam to sleep three times, but eventually she's able to get the KO with Confusion. His Haunter helps us out by going for Curse, which lets Pam get the KO with Confusion, earning us the fourth badge. Over in Olivine, I find on Jasmine at the top of the lighthouse, who sends me to Cienwood to get some medicine for the sick Ampharos. That poor sick Pokemon is going to have to wait though, because before I bring her the medicine, I'm going to head over to the gym and battle Chuck. Sure, getting the medicine to a potentially dying Pokemon seems like a time-sensitive issue, but if she wanted this job done quickly, she shouldn't have trusted a complete stranger that she just met. I'm simply teaching her a life lesson. Now it's time to teach Chuck a lesson. I lead with Lana versus Primeape, who immediately goes for a double team, which is very cringeworthy behavior if you ask me. Lana hits a confusion that actually manages to confuse Primeape in the process, a sign that the universe agrees with me about Chuck's double teaming behavior. The universe then begins to send me mixed messages, as he breaks through and hits a rock slide before going down to another confusion. Polyrath comes in and hits a Surf, then Lana hits a Leech Seed. At this point, there's nothing Chuck can do. Another Surf connects and Lana sets up a Reflect in case he switches to Body Slam, which he does and it gets the Paralysis, but Lana breaks through and puts Polyrath to sleep. From here, I can safely switch into Ray, who's able to get the KO with Aerial Ace, earning us our fifth badge. Out of the kindness of my heart, I decide to prioritize getting the medicine to the lighthouse now that I defeated Chuck, and thankfully the Ampharos was able to hang on for dear life. We can technically fight Jasmine now, but for some absurd reason, the seven gym leader has a lower level cap than her, so I decide to head over to Mahogany Town instead. I defeat the Gyarados in the Lake of Rage, then I meet this nice fella named Lance who asks for my help. I happily oblige, but once again take a detour before helping a stranger in order to catch a new team member, Sterling the Venonat. Unfortunately, Sterling has a minus speed nature, so for now he won't be replacing Frambois. Now, it's time to meet up with our new friend Lance. I wonder what he needed help with. Oh, uh... I guess you needed help hiding the body? What have I gotten myself into? After dealing with an endless barrage of Team Rocket members, Lance asked me to help him knock out some Electrode, and I'm not gonna say no to a guy that just killed someone like 20 minutes ago. After we're done dumping the body into the Lake of Rage, I head back to Mahogany Town and get ready to face Price. His team isn't exactly intimidating thanks to Katya. I don't even bother getting her all the way up to the level cap, although maybe I should have as Brick Break just misses a KO. Her shell bell keeps her healthy though, and she's able to Brick Break her way through his entire team for the win. Now that Price is out of the way, it's time to head back to the 6th gym. Oh, you know how capable I am? Why don't we get out of here and... Oh, right. Jasmine. Yeah, we were thinking the same thing. Good talk. Jasmine's Steel-type Pokemon meet a similar fate to Price, as Katya chops her way through both Magnemite. Steelix is a different story though with its massive defense. Katya does under half with Brick Break and then she gets hit with a Screech. I don't want to risk getting crit with an Iron Tail, so I swap into Mallory as she goes for a Sandstorm. Mallory can't really do much damage here, but she can use Bug Bite to steal Steelix Citrus Berry and bring her below half. I swap back into Katya who gets hit with an Iron Tail, which definitely would have gotten the KO with a crit, so that was a bit scary. Thankfully luck is on our side and the Grim Reaper isn't quite ready for Katya. He is, however, ready for Jasmine Steelix. I head over to Goldenrod City in order to deal with Team Rocket. I get a Rocket uniform and man, we look so tough. Frambois, try and look tough. Or just play with some garbage, I guess. Speaking of garbage, our rival shows up and completely ruins our foolproof plan all because he's dealing with some deep psychological trauma he can't cope with. 
Thanks to his insecurities, I now have to fight my way through another horde of rocket grunts until I finally get to Petrol, who is pretending to be the director. His team is straight up disgusting, with multiple coughing and a wheezing that all know self-destruct or explosion. Thankfully, with the choice specs I found at the Lake of Rage while helping Lance bury that guy that he killed, Framboise is able to side-beam her way through his entire team. I head down to the basement where a rival shows up again, but this time he wants to battle. This isn't going to help him fix his insecurities because we crush him once again. Although Pam does get crit with a flame wheel which gave us a bit of a scare. Other than that and some annoying confusion luck, we're able to defeat him quite easily. I finally make my way through the remaining Team Rocket members and find Executive Archer. Unfortunately for Archer, Katya is here to break his heart. Now that Team Rocket is out of the way and our painfully awkward interaction with the director is over, it's time to get back on track and head over to Blackthorn City. Up until this point, it's been surprisingly smooth sailing, but Claire and her Dragon types present a much more difficult challenge than any of the previous gym leaders. This is where not having guts on Katya really hurts, so I'm gonna need to call in some backup. In spite of his minus speed nature, I decide to recruit Sterling to the squad. He needs some serious training though, so I head over to Cherry Grove and EV train him against Pidgey and Rattata for the speed EVs. He single-handedly wiped out the entire local population of birds. It was a bloodbath. With Sterling fully EV trained in speed and special attack, it's time to take on the final gym leader in Johto. I lead with Frambois against her Gyarados, who avoids a flinch from Bite and then lands a Sleep Powder. This allows for a switch into Cheryl, who learned the move Nasty Plot. Cheryl doesn't have a particularly great special attack stat, so it may seem a bit odd. But thanks to Baton Pass, she's able to set up three Nasty Plots, then Baton Pass to give the stat boost to Sterling, who comes in on a Dragon Range. From here, with the Choice Specs equipped and plus six special attacks, Sterling is able to outspeed and sweep through Claire's entire team, with the help of the Sludge Bomb TM given to me as a reward for putting up with the Team Rocket side plot. Once Claire is done being a sore loser, she gives us the eighth and final badge. From here, it's off to fight the Kimono Girls, but the combination of Sterling, Pam, and Katya are too much for them to handle. I really wish there was more to do with the Belchime Trail. I love this aesthetic so much. With Ho-Oh successfully trapped in the PC for the rest of its life, it's time to head to Victory Road for one last battle with our rival. I wish I could say this time it's different, but he's massively underleveled here, so it's a bit of an anticlimactic end to this one-sided rivalry. I've made one major change to the team for the Elite Four, and it's that I've brought Lana out of the PC. She learned the move Psychic right at the level cap as an execute, which seemed like a sign that it was meant to be. Usually the first member of the Elite Four is a pushover thanks to the level advantage, but Will's Psychic types pose a greater threat than usual thanks to our limited defensive type coverage. I lead with Cheryl vs Zatu and I was anticipating a Confuse Ray, but instead they opt for a Psychic, which happens to crit and take Cheryl to just 16 HP. We're off to a great start. Fortunately, Cheryl can outspeed and one-shot the Jinx, but now it's time to switch as Exeggutor comes in. Mallory gets hit with a Psychic, then gets outsped as she goes for a Reflect, which causes a Bug Bite to no longer be a one-hit KO. Then another critical hit takes Mallory low before she retaliates with a wasted critical hit for the KO. Now I have to switch again, so I send in Pam on a Water Pulse, which shockingly doesn't confuse us. Pam misses a Hypnosis, which allows Slowbro to get off an Amnesia, but she hits one on the following turn. I swap to Lana and hit a Leech Seed as Slowbro stays asleep, then a Psychic in order to do enough damage to Slowbro to allow a Leaf Storm to get the KO thanks to its special defense increase. Zatu comes in and hits an Aerial Ace, but Lana is insanely bulky and tanks it well, and then hits a Leech Seed. Zatu switches to Confuse Ray and Lana hurts herself in Confusion. Having just about enough of Will's shenanigans, I swap back into Pam on an Aerial Ace to get rid of Confusion, then Pam gets hit with a Psychic, but misses her 95% accurate move because of course she does. Thanks to her bulk and Leech Seed heal, she's able to take another Psychic and then land an Air Slash on the following turn. I have to switch again, so I send in Lana on a Psychic. The combination of Psychic and Leech Seed finally finish off Zatu and end the battle. Hopefully our luck isn't as bad going forward, because if it is, we're in a lot of trouble. Next up is Koga, whose team we have a much better matchup with, although there are some potentially tricky matchups. I lead with Sterling versus his Abomination, and she's able to knock it out with a side beam. Crobat comes in and obviously outspeeds, so I swap into Pam as Koga shamelessly goes for a double team. Pam sets up a Reflect after being hit with a Wing Attack. Then I swap into Lana, who can now shrug off a Wing Attack with ease. Koga goes for another double team, but Lana has no time for his nonsense and lands a Psychic for the KO. Venomoth comes in, and Lana's Quick Claw activates and allows her to avoid taking any damage, although Venomoth's moves are pretty laughable. Fortress comes in, so I hit it with a Leech Seed, then swap into my own superior fortress. The leech seed damage combined with the shell bell heal keep Mallory healthy while also chipping away at his HP. Koga wastes some more time with the full restore, but eventually Mallory wins the war of attrition. His last Pokemon is Muck, and while it is incredibly annoying with Minimize, it can't actually do any damage to Mallory. She eventually lands enough digs to take it down, and with that, Koga is defeated. Up next is Bruno. He has quite a few moves that could really hurt us, but fortunately for us, he leads off with a Hitmontop, who can't do a whole lot of anything to Lana. I've taught Lana the move Sunny Day in order to 
to activate her chlorophyll ability. Unfortunately, Hitmontop went for Dig, so we do waste a turn of sunlight before taking it down with a Psychic. With the sun out, Lana is able to outspeed both Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan and get the KO with Psychic, taking out two of his bigger threats as they both had fire type moves that we really can't deal with. Onyx comes in and lands a rock slide and gets the flinch, then he sets up a sandstorm which quickly gets overtaken by sunlight. The solar beam obliterates his pile of rocks, then a Psychic is able to knock out Machamp in one hit. Lana may have sat on the sidelines through most of this run, but sitting in the PC made her lust for blood that much stronger. She's been a menace so far. Last of the Elite Four is Karen. She finally gives us an opportunity to use Katya, who I'm sure many of you assumed would be the star of the show down the stretch. But up until this point, she's been more of a supporting character. She's able to knock out Umbreon with a close combat, which prompts Karen to send in Murkrow, who also gets taken down with a close combat. Clearly having not learned her lesson, she sends in Houndoom, who orders the same thing the other two just had. She's finally had enough of Katya punching her Pokemon, so she sends in Gengar, so I swap into Lana on a Focus Blast. I'm a bit worried about her going for Destiny Bond, so I decided to swap into Pam instead as she lands a Hypnosis after taking a Focus Blast. Two hits from Extrasensory just managed to miss out on the KO, which prompts Karen to use a full restore, which is pretty unfortunate. Thankfully, the second time around, Pam gets the range and gets the KO. Last up is Vileplume, but Pam is able to get a flinch with an Air Slash thanks to her holding the King's Rock because I couldn't decide what item to give her. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Karen is clearly upset with the outcome and asks to speak to the manager. While she's busy complaining, I continue on and face by far the biggest obstacle of this run, the champion, Lance. His team is flat out terrifying for us, but I think I've got a decent plan. I lead with Mallory to take the Intimidate from his Gyarados, then go for Protect to scout out what move he's going for. She sets up a Reflect and then I swap to Cheryl, but he switches to Dragon Pulse, which doesn't do much. Cheryl is able to get off two Nasty Plots, but I don't want to risk being crit, so I go for Baton Pass and send in Lana on a Waterfall. I am at risk of being frozen by Ice Fang, but I don't really have much of a choice. Thankfully, she isn't frozen and gets off a sunny day. A Solar Beam takes out his Gyarados and Lana heals up with her Shell Belt. At plus four special attack, attack and with the sun out, she's able to outspeed and KO Lance's biggest threat for us, his Charizard. Lana continues on her rampage by taking out his first Dragonite, and can even outspeed Aerodactyl thanks to Chlorophyll. Unfortunately, the sunlight faded as his level 50 Dragonite comes in and I really don't have a safe switch. I know Lana can survive a non-critical hit from Fire Blast, which he goes for and takes her to just 36 HP. Even at just plus 4, she can then retaliate with a Psychic and get the one-hit KO. In hindsight, I should have gone for Sunny Day there because now he sends in his final Dragonite and it outspeeds so I have to swap into Mallory. I go for Protect to scout out a Thunder, then miscalculate how much damage that would do to Mallory as she gets hit with one on the following turn and gets taken down. Our first death of the run on the last Pokemon of the Elite Four. I failed you, Mallory. This could have been avoided. I send in Katya, who I've taught the move Rock Tomb to, and she connects, but it does less than half. Then she gets paralyzed by a Thunder Wave. A Dragon Rush takes Katya to just 28 HP, then she gets fully paralyzed. At this point, I'm starting to worry that I threw this battle entirely. I swap to Pam who gets taken to just 38 HP before her berry activates from another Dragon Rush. Then Pam misses a Hypnosis, which isn't all that surprising given its low accuracy. But Lance doesn't seem to have a problem hitting his plethora of low accuracy attacks and hits Pam with another Thunder and takes her down. Man, this is rough. Sterling comes in and hits a Sludge Bomb, but Dragonite survives at like 1 HP, then hits another Dragon Rush and I thought Sterling was done for, but he survives at just 6 HP like a mad lad. Lance uses a full restore, but now the tables have turned and Sterling is able to get the KO with two more Sludge Bombs, earning us the win and making us the new champion. It's definitely depressing to know that I could have beaten Lance without losing a single team member. And while Pam and Mallory can never be replaced in our hearts, they can be physically replaced. There's quite a few new encounters over in Kanto, although most of that part of the game is pretty uneventful. Although I was surfing over to Blaine's gym and I did run into a shiny tentacle, None of the gyms were really worth covering in Kanto, but before we get to the final battle of the run, I just wanted to take a moment to point out just how horrifying slacking looks when it's the Pokemon following you around. Well, I'm glad you're happy, Cyril, but your face is straight up terrifying. In spite of his appearance, I bring him along in order to face Red at the top of Mount Silver. I lead with Katya versus Pikachu, and she's able to knock it out with an Earthquake. Charizard comes in, but Katya knows Rock Slide now, which connects and gets an easy KO as well. Lapras comes in next, which goes down to a close combat. I bet this is what most of you were expecting the Elite Four to feel like with Katya tearing through everyone. Blastoise comes in and that's finally someone that Katya isn't equipped to deal with, so I swap into Cyril hoping his face will put a shock into Blastoise, but instead he nails us with a blizzard which causes Cyril to freeze. That's not ideal. Cyril gets taken into the red and doesn't defrost, so I have to switch. I send in Woodhouse who's able to survive a blizzard even with his low special defense thanks to his massive HP stat. That joy is short-lived though as Blastoise outspeeds and takes him down. I send in the late game MVP in Lana and she survives a blizzard, then gets off a 
sunny day to put an end to this Blastoise's reign of terror. Venusaur comes in, but Lana is fueled by her desire to avenge her fallen tree comrade and takes it out. Snorlax comes in and it also knows Blizzard, but its low special attack stat means Lana is able to survive a hit from it after getting off the Leech Seed. I send in Claudette, who avoids a Blizzard. Then she's able to take Snorlax low with a Drain Punch. Then survives a Blizzard and Leech Seed finishes off Snorlax, earning us the victory over Red. That was a lot of fun. I haven't played a Nuzlocke with a non-monotype team in a little while, so it was nice having some variety for a change. If you've made it this far, please consider giving the video a like as it really helps me out. If you want to see more content like this, consider subscribing to the channel as well. Now that my PC is fixed, I can get back to regularly uploading more videos. It's about time for me to head out. Thanks for watching, and I'll smell you later.